Uh, welcome to another episode of A Black Hands. I'm very, very happy to be here. Uh, and with us are our brothers, Chris. We got uh, Ray, who I almost said Shoemaker Reef because I was just reading the thing and it threw me off. But we got, <laughs> we got Ray. <laughs> I just saw that. He always got something crazy on his joint. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> it's all good. And we got the one. We got we got Sharif. Uh, and fellas, in, instead of just a regular check in, I want to ask you all a question. If you all got to build from scratch, just a quintessential, not the, because it can be different, a quintessential black male teacher for yourself or for your children, just what characteristics would they have? What would that person like possess? Hmm. I'll just jump in and say, that's a very hard question. First of all, I mean, in any teacher, there's so much you can say, but I would say, for a black male teacher, I would think just a firm grasp on like the forward sidedness of what what I need to learn. Like I've always felt like uh, uh, a, a soft mentoring, like the ability to know you're going to need to master these things because it's going to be good for you in the future. And if I trust you that you have my best interest in mind, I'll follow that type your lead on that. I think a sense of humor, a sense of like uh, familial like that i don't know like interpersonal stuff like you know the ability to 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 coach rather than mm -hmm. just teach or just lecture but you know just like the 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 hard and soft skills the hard skills of being a teacher but then the soft skills the cultural soft skills of being that trustworthy coach who i can trust you've got my best interest in heart because you seem like an uncle or you seem like a you know like an elder in my in my community uh that's what i would say but the sense of humor is the one I think people miss over too, because a lot of times we want the the hard black man or the the disciplinarian or the person who can keep it all together. It'd be nice to have some some folks. You know, you can be both. You can be both. You can be <laughs> both at the same time. It made me think of Joe time. Pesci. Oh, you think it's funny? You think it's funny? <laughs> oh, you think it's funny? I, I amuse you. That's the first thing. That came to well, Ray and Reef, I'm curious what y'all like. What would that? What what would some of those characteristics be for yours? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think I have something similar with uh, Chris. I, I would start off with, like, that they know how to teach, you know, um, that they have, like, the content expertise, but also, like, this accountability. that They feel accountable mm -hmm. for my success um, or for the child's success. And, um, you know, like, culture, culture of learning, culture of, commu you know, community, just, like, they know how to build relationships, create a, a learning environment that's just conducive for for kids. I would also hope that they that they're conscious, that they understand how all these dots connect, mm -hmm. at least most of them. Um, the connection between educational justice and racial justice, the work that they're doing is a form of activism. Um, so that level of consciousness, I think, for me is uh, really important. But, uh, you know, they love what they're doing. But yeah, and and they know how to teach because I know a lot of folks who they say they love kids, but their pedagogy, pedagog, pedagogical expertise is a little sus. So mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. so good pedagogy. I'm like I they should go. Know. I'm like you can love kids and work at the library. That's great. You know what I mean? Maybe teaching ain't ain't the thing. Hey, I got you. So let me. So so uh, Chris said it's funny. Uh, basically, you know, you uh, funny. <laughs> not, doesn't necessarily have to be a disciplinarian, but it's good at what he does. You're saying like has strong pedagogy is good at what they do. Uh, kind of has some consciousness about them. Understand our people. Ray, what about you? What would you what would you add to that? Or what? Would, or yours could be so, completely different. It will be. Um, so I think that. Uh, I would like for uh, the black male teacher to be a member of the LGBTQIA community or be adjacent to it as in like an ally. Uh, I feel like um, the approach to the work um, should be all encompassing. And I don't want I don't want there to be a lens of ignorance in terms of like all kids not being able to be seen. Also, um, I think when teachers get into the classroom, I need them to see their blind spots. And so a lot of teachers teach to the average student. So they teach to the middle. Um, I need for these teachers to be teaching to the highs and teaching to the lows and um, you know, using uh, differentiation as more than just a buzzword, but actually going in and challenging all of their students. Um, I need for there to be some parental engagement in terms of how they reach out to parents and how they engage with parents. 
Um, I put on tw- I put on Twitter. I got cursed out this weekend on a Saturday, blocking and tackling mm-hmm. for uh for 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 a colleague. That's what's up. And I, I, did that, I, that's I need what's up. I need for I need for <laughs> folks that come into our communities to know that those kind of things can occur, and that's no blight on the community. That just means that you need to love uh what you're doing and be passionate about what you're doing. You need to be just as passionate about teaching as these uh parents are about making sure their kids. Uh, get get the right teacher. Got you, got you. Um, okay, I mean, mine would be. Uh, I think that was an interesting one. Uh, mine would probably be. Uh, I want somebody that's strong, that that's strong in what they do, strong in their community, that like really understands and is from that community. I think it is actually you know really important um, when I'm thinking about the type of kid that I want this person to be teaching. Uh, I'm thinking of somebody who is a master at their craft that really, really knows what they're doing um, and 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 can really take me through a lot of just they, they they if we're not getting it, they know other ways to get it to us. Right. They don't blame the kids because the kids not getting a lesson. It's like, yo, I got to do it this way. And our guest is one of those people. Uh, Mr. Brown is having some issues getting on. But uh, I'm going to talk about him while, even though he's not here yet because uh, technology is, you know, technology. But I'll call him at, if, if that's what we need to. I got the I got the Roadcaster Pro set up. But Mr. Brown is somebody who uh, not only did he do this for 46 years, not only was he a Black Panther, not only uh, was he just a staple in that community, played ball and was a legend in ball and all that stuff too, man. But that dude figured out who my family was, went and learned about what we were going through. When we were struggling with algebra, he taught it to us like a language and gave us definitions. And every lesson had like a history lesson to it. So, you know, early on, I knew what Kemet was. uh, And he was the first person that introduced me to that. He was the person that told me that, you know, I should that I should be proud to be black because we are the ones that started this whole game and then would tell us and we would laugh like we didn't like believe him. And he would break it down, like just, you know, in the way that he did. Um, And when you mentioned Mr. Brown's name in Oakland, he's taught at a whole bunch of different type of schools, but everybody is there and ready to kind of just show him love. So uh, while we figure out these technical difficulties, um, I just want to ask you all, because I always get pegged as or people try to say that we teacher bash or this, that. And I, I don't think that I teacher bash. What I do think that I do is I had really high quality one time very young and i just was taught not to accept just mediocrity and so i don't want sharif to go first because we know the type of school sharif went to uh we know his school his school was perfect but ray and chris while we get this set up like you know do you do you have a teacher that spoke to you in that type of way and i'm gonna mute myself while i figure this part out so I went to the famed St. Tammany Parish Schools, uh, the best school district in the state of Louisiana. And so uh, just want to make that clear and name that, right? Uh, but then also, you know, I, I had some really phenomenal teachers uh, growing up. I had some Black teachers that were a member of my church um, that, you know, that went all out for us, right? Uh, they were revered in our communities uh, when we walked by their house, like, we knew like it was a certain level of respect like you weren't talking loud you were just being respectful you weren't cursing you weren't doing any of those things right um i still feel the same way when i walk by these houses now right you know some live there some don't and so um been very blessed to have had uh the black teachers that i had and not all not all of them were good i i i think uh 98 of them was good but i had miss jones in the seventh grade social studies and she was horrible right and so I just want to name the fact that just because you are a black teacher does not mean that you are good for the community or that you are good for black kids. But fortunately for me, I've had some really good teachers. And uh, and yeah, that's where I'm at. Yeah, you know, um, it was interesting. I posted a picture of my daughter and me uh, a couple of days ago, and I don't do that much, but uh, I got a lot of like... Uh, clicks on likes and one of them was from my fourth grade teacher <laughs> uh, i thought that was hilarious it's like oh, I, f- I forgot i'm facebook friends with one of my fourth grade teachers uh incidentally not a black male uh uh or a black teacher um so i don't have so so 
this is an interesting show for me in that it's I meet a lot of people that have that teacher they could talk about that teacher that uh, gave them a great year or did a great thing or added deeply to their knowledge. I, it's just not an experience I have. So I'm not in touch with it. Uh, I, I didn't have that teacher. I didn't have um, a meaningful relationship with any of my teachers. I don't remember most of them. I can remember maybe three or four teachers and then some faceless people at different grades, like different grades. I have recollections but none of them are around me being connected to a person. They're just about, I remember the body shape <laughs> of the person in, in a third grade, for instance, can barely make out what I remember about the face, but nothing about relationship or having been taught well or felt, felt particularly connected. So a lot of my sense and feelings of schools, if I have good sense of teachers or good feelings of teachers, it came after, uh, uh, it came when I from from my kids' teachers, not from my own. So when I think about to you know to my own life or whatnot, I don't. And really this have is that nothing way. to do with age or anything. It's about the experience. The experience, yeah. I can't remember yeah. a good experience with any of my teachers. I can't remember mm -hmm. any of them being strong. I can remember falling behind in multiple circumstances and getting no help. Uh, you know, so so my advocacy is honest in that. Um, when, like when I when I have antipathy about teaching and about that whole kind of like, oh my God, schools were the best years of my life type of thing or whatnot. I don't have that. And I'm just honest with people about that. But as a parent, I've seen a lot of teachers and got to relive it and got to see my kids experience better teaching okay. than I had. And Sharif, and, Sharif you know, so. I, know, I know you're going to jump in there, but real quick, uh, I want to see if, if I got Mr. Brown with us uh, on the phone. Mr. Brown, can you hear us? I can hear everybody. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good to hear yes, you. sir. Yes, sir. So, so Mr. Brown, uh, okay. sorry for the technical difficulties. You're on the school computer, so uh, Kip don't play that, apparently. Uh, they don't like any external stuff. Me and the producer tried to get you on, but we can, we can, we can do it old school with the phone, man. So, I mean, let me just bring you up to speed. So, on this, you got Ray, who is a superintendent uh, in the New York area and, and is incredible at what he does. You have Sharif El Mekki, uh, who was a great educator, who uh, was a principal and now leads a national initiative uh, to uh, hire more black male educators. And he's part of the reason that I really wanted you to be on this show, uh, just to sync up with a lot of his work. And then you got Chris Stewart, uh, who has been a parent advocate for a long time with roots in both the Bay Area and New Orleans and, and, and he, he done been all over, but uh, he is just one of the best people to get parent voices and in, in just out there. I was telling the story as we were introducing you. We, we started with a prompt of if we could build our quintessential black male teacher to teach us or our children, um, we all um, we all wanted to make sure that we gave our description. And the description that I gave was of the man that I met in the seventh and eighth grade. Uh, my algebra teacher who took a kid with a really jacked up accent who was living in between shelters and angry and so, had a lot of things right, going so. on, um, who had a lot of things going on and a man that pulled him out to the side and said, Hey man, check this out. You can be great just because this is the path that your parents was on. Don't mean it got to be your path. I expect excellence for you. You won't be doing X, Y, and Z. Uh, and as somebody who's done this work for 46 years, we just wanted to make sure we honored you appropriately into this conversation. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, everybody listening, welcome uh, Mr. Herman Brown. Uh, Mr. Brown. Yes, sir. Yes. yes. So before we just, I'm going to let the fellas ask their questions or whatnot, but can you just briefly, uh, you know, I, you know, I got to tell you briefly because you'll take this thing over. But briefly, can you just... Uh, Talk about what got you into teaching 46 years ago and just how you did it for so long. Okay, I'm going to try to be briefly, Brother Charles. You already called it. But <laughs> I'm going to try to be briefly. But for, for all y'all, look, I was born in 1951. I was born, born and raised in West Oakland, a rough neighborhood, tough time. And uh, my parents, they were from Jim Crow era. My father was born in 1908, 1913. My mother, 1913, just to get that where their mind was in raising me. My father was 48 when I was born. No, I'm sorry, 43. My mother was 38 when I was born. 
So as I was growing up with a lot of people in that era, from the Jim Crow era, I came into a new era of witnessing the uh, civil rights movement that was conducted with Dr. King as the leader. But at the same time, as that movement was not really making the progression for younger people like me, along came big, bad Malcolm X. And his message that he sent out to us at that time is what molded me into be a fighter for change, not to be in a sit-in, but to get out there and be a stand-up, stand-out person. And as I went through everybody in my teenage years of uh, going through uh, junior high school and high school, I graduated from high school in 1969. And that was right at the time of the Vietnam War was going on and the Black Panther Party was establishing itself as messengers to all of us youngsters. And as that was happening, y'all, I lost the interest in my life of what I once upon a time thought I wanted to be a basketball player. I wanted to be an athlete for my life. But I became aware of the consciousness of what was going on to black people in this country, in this racist country that we lived in, that we had to deal with all of our lives. And I said, if, if I can do anything in my contributions of going to college and getting the degree, not to be out, y'all, standing on the soapbox and talking and speaking from a podium, but can I get into a classroom? Can I get in front of the kids where I won't have to worry about being assassinated for sending a true message, but to get that message across in the classroom? And that's when I made the decision, y'all, to say, I'm not worried about running up and down the floor, trying to shoot baskets and make points and make money doing that, there are a lot of children out there that came from the same situations that I did, and they need somebody that's a role model to them, said, I did it, you can do it. So, Brother Charles, I say this to you directly, and uh, 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 everybody who else is listening, just to wrap it up. If I had made a decision to say, I'm going to go ahead on and pursue being a prostitute to an organization like uh, uh, professional sports and selling my Self, that I would not have gone in the direction to come back to where I came from and going to the school, you never would have met me. I never would have seen you. You and I would never have made the connection that we did. So again, everybody uh, on, on, on this closure on this so we can move forward. Uh, Dr. Cole is my major achievement of everything what I did and sacrificed for the comeback entity to reach out and pass the torch. See, that's what it's all about. And I passed it towards to him, and he still passed it. Okay, there you go. All right, fellas, uh, you know, I got other questions, but I don't want to definitely hog the space. I mean, there's a he was a Black Panther. There was stories around that and around getting kicked out or, or, or banned from St. Mary's. I don't, I, I'll let somebody else ask that. But before I hog too much of it, um, and Sharif, I know I cut you off earlier, brother, so I, I'll give you the floor uh, just for the next question or how you want to lead this piece. Yeah, no, I mean, not a problem at all. Mr. Brown, it's, it's uh, great to meet you. Always good to, uh, you know, hear not only the uh, experiences, but the impact. Uh, you know, I appreciate the, you know, uh, how you described of, of passing a torch, you know, uh, forward, because that's exactly what, you know, how a lot of us view teaching, good teaching um, is. And it's not just the content, but it's also the inspiration. I'm curious uh, as far as like how were you prepared to teach because we're we're talking a lot about you know teacher effectiveness and uh, which ties into their preparation. Uh, I pulled up a a tweet that uh, Stewart had had sent out a while back. He was quoting uh, Linda Darling Hammond where she talked about uh, so many folks are uh, educators are unprepared, and so because they're unprepared, they actually uh, you know not only blame the kids, but really look at the kids with a level of, uh, you know, contempt, uh, mm -hmm. you know, for, for whatever. And I, I think it was, you know, it just really captured, you know, a lot of what I believe about teacher prep, but curious, like, how, how were you prepared? How did you approach the work even, you know, during your, you know, career? 46 years is a long time, you know, uh, like a long time. So God bless you. That's, that's super dope and amazing. Uh, but Really curious about like how you how you prepared, 
you know, um, to teach, to teach that long, to be effective, um, and particularly like what that can do to inform, you know, other educators, um, principals, teachers, whoever's, uh, you know, touching kids inside and, and outside of uh, schools and classrooms. Okay, in, in, in my perspective, y'all, uh, in, in all of my honesty and experience is that there is no preparation that anybody can have to walk into a classroom to be a teacher, no matter how much uh, teacher training that you have had, because I had that uh, at St. Mary's College where I got my teaching credentials and taking the classes, the so forth education classes, you never uh, uh, understand what it's like when you step into the classroom and there you are in front of these young people for the first time in your life on saying, how do I get this message across to them? Nothing that's academically that was textbook. This is my experience now. I'm just sharing mine. There was nothing that prepared me for that. Except that I went into a classroom already with a decision in my mind on what I was going in there for, which was to deliver to my students the message on who you are, where you are. Do you understand your history? Do you understand the history of the oppressor? Because I did my student teaching at the high school, y'all, where I graduated from, which was a, a black high school. I mean, it was 98% black. That's from the neighborhood, you know, where I came from. And that's where I went back to, to give them a conscious awareness of open up as Malcolm X. And I would say Malcolm as I talk, that what he told us is that you've got to take your mind from being directly where you are in your neighborhood, go beyond that and look at yourself globally in the position of where you are and understand your history, where you came from so that you can understand where you are and where you are going. That was my message all the time. And as I was delivering that message, y'all, to students, I saw students stop what they were doing and they were listening to me because they had never heard it before. That got me to get their attention. Once I got their attention, then the subject matter was nothing more but just going on and say, okay, now I'm going to deliver to you what the curriculum is asking you to do, but keeping it in your mind all the time. These are things that you have to be able to understand. You have to be able to overcome any difficulties academically that you have and work on those things so that you can make yourself into being a very powerful and successful student. So my message was always the one, everybody, was that you, to the black student, you, you are the person. You are a part of the people. You have a history that you did not come to this country in fighting. You came to this country forcibly to do labor. And you will always be in a position like that, look down upon that you got to know the truth about your origins, and then let's move forward. And one of my brothers, y'all, because uh, 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 i got to keep it tight, because I can go on and on, because I'm a teacher, and I've been teaching for all these years. But uh, a, a brother of mine, a Muslim brother of mine said, there's an old Arab proverb that says, when the student is ready, then the teacher will arrive. And when I used to tell students that, they had no idea what I was talking about. I said, okay, hmm. when you open your mind out up to accept the knowledge, then I become your teacher. But until you do that, I'm just another person standing in front of you. So if I can answer that question with all of that behind it, I went in with being the deliverer of that message that was given down over and over all the years as we as black people have had to deal with our struggles to pass it on. So I saw myself as passing the message on. Mm. 
Mm. Uh, Ray or Chris, feel free. Yeah, so, <sighs> Mr. Brown, thank you. For uh for for the time that you have put in, thank you for the forty six years of excellence that you have given your community. Uh, thank you for your commitment to your community. I love it. I hope that I have forty six years to be able to give to uh to 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 my community or communities that I serve. So my question is right. Uh, great teachers are not just born, and it just doesn't happen overnight. What kind of preparation were you doing during the summer months? the so-called off time for teachers in order to prepare you for the fall? Okay. As I, again, uh, will always say this to all of you, always, uh, the spirit. I'm very spiritual in what I have done as a commitment to the young people and the students. There was nothing that I ever did did y'all no more than just I'm, I'm a believer in what my responsibility mm. has been to always stay on top of that and always be committed every single day and be consistent that when the school year started up I know my subject math I can teach that but for me as the teacher my responsibility is to come into the classroom every single day. And all y'all, I'm saying this to y'all in honesty and truth. I have an incredible record of being attended at the school. I have never had absences. I have always been there religiously uh, to be uh, on, on, on my job. But in my mind, in my spirit, I knew that when I got in front of the student was to always be the person that was solid rock. That when they came in and they saw Mr. Brown, Mr. Brown was not changing. Mr. Brown was consistent. Mr. Brown is always mm. here. Mr. Brown is not going to tolerate you, the student, boy or girl, not to pursue the fulfillment that you can be, not by words that I say to them, but by how I carry myself. I've always been professional. I always dress professionally. I always am there and I always speak to them with positiveness. And if they are not doing their responsibility, I will let them know not so much as a teacher, but a lot of times as a parent or when my younger days as a big brother. But now in my last years, I have talked to my students to say, I'm talking to you like a grandfather now. So when I go in, I go in with consistency mm. on what I stand for and respect for the hardship that I went through to get my college degree and to get my teaching credential and to be a professional and project that message mentally, spiritually, and physically in front of them. Mm. Got some millennials that need to hear some of that uh, when you chop that up, Anchor. <laughs> they <laughs> miss those days. <laughs> I heard so much in there that was amazing to me. Like, you know, the, the word consistent, I was consistent or I am consistent is a, that's a whole show by itself. That can mean a lot uh, for young people to have a trusted, valuable person in their life who is talking to them as somebody who is proud of their craft and proud of what it took to become the head of that class and to teach. Um, so has credible authority for that reason, but also has credible authority because they're talking to you like a brother. They're talking to you like a, a, a father. They're talking to you like an older brother, like a grandparent. Uh, I heard all of that and it just made me feel good. It made me feel good in a way that like, if I had kids in a class like that right now, which I don't, I would feel better. Uh, uh, than some of what we have going on today. My question, Mr. Brown, would be knowing that you had this, this commitment culturally and socially uh, to, to do your job differently than other people do their job because you're drawing from Black power, you're drawing from the civil rights movement, you're drawing from uh, uh, your, your experience in life with Black uh, Panther ideology, if there were things that you wanted to do for the children that you know that, that were good for them, but you wouldn't 
because of the powers that be or the way that teaching is structured and arranged, you weren't able to do it. Okay. Uh, paraphrase that question again, because I want to be direct on how I'm hitting the question. Yeah. So if you are motivated by doing the best you can because you have you know, cultural knowledge and you, you know, there's other stuff like from Black Panthers and other things that you're thinking in your mind, but you're working within a system. Your teaching is, is within a system. Being in a classroom is within a system. I've often heard educators say they can't do all the things that they know that they should do for their kids because of the system that they're in or because of the way that teaching is arranged or whatever. And I'm wondering if you encountered that, if you had to, if there were things you wanted to do for your students that you weren't able to do, that you were restrained from doing from them uh, because of the system okay. that you were in. All right, now, now I got you. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, the system, and I will be very open, open with it because it's a racist system of how it's designed. From my experience, I don't have a doctor's degree in any type of sociology perspective or being able to say I have data to analyze what is being placed upon the teaching environment in the public school system, at least in Oakland Unified School District where I taught and from other people I know, it's across the board. But the, 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 the racism that exists, and I'm talking about white supremacy. This is my experience within a school system. Even if you have black supervisors, and I'm talking about uh, people that's uh, on, on uh, the, the so-called higher levels of the school district with the titles that they take with them, I can't even bring any of those titles up right now, but with principals and also other uh, 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 vice principals and counselors and, and so forth, that these people are the ones who have a mindset that they have and they make decisions uh, uh, based on a historical perspective on how we treat and how we deal with uh, uh, young black people in America or old on domination and uh, a, a domination mindset is something that has always existed. Mm -hmm. And I have had to deal with that. Uh, and just to share this with you all, when I was at the junior high school where Dr. Cole with Brother Charles was my student in algebra class, in the beginning of my career of teaching mathematics at that particular school, which at that time, it was not predominantly black. It was a school that was predominantly Asian. At that time, black students were coming to that school uh, trickling in because of what was going on in, in, in the neighborhoods surrounding where the school were, and uh, black students were able to actually move out of uh, restrictions of their physical environment and so-called ghetto realities in neighborhoods and come to that school where there was a, a, a dominance of Asian students. At that school, y'all, they had a tier structure of math instruction that they had a geometry class. Mm -hmm. Then they had a couple of algebra classes. And then below the algebra classes, they had what was known as, uh, you know, math one, math two, which was all of the, the, the skill building classes. The black students and brown students overpopulated those classes of hmm. math A, math B, whatever they wanted to call it. The algebra students were predominantly Asian students. And I mean, like, you have three algebra classes, y'all. In each class, you might have two black students in the class at the school. The geometry class, you might only have one black student at the school. I went into that and attacked that system, y'all, and said, this is not right. You're creating a gateway of keeping the black and brown students from taking advanced math because you're putting in front of them a so-called uh, interest exam that you know that's designed that they will not pass this exam. 
the majority of the students who do not, and I'm speaking for mathematics right now, who do not have structural skill levels with rational numbers, I'm talking about fractions and decimals, those type of tests will keep you from going into an algebra class. I went after them like this to, to destroy that system and said, if you can teach algebra, because it's the language, I said, if you can teach the math, where all you're using right now is the introductory with integers, where they can deal with that. And if they have access in the beginning to use some technology with those scientific calculators, they can pass this class because they understand it. The skill that they see that they cannot do with the uh, rational numbers, they will see, okay, this is something that I need to do, and that will motivate them into doing it. The mm-hmm. whole Oakland Unified School District came down on me all the time, y'all, when we would go to those uh, meetings that you would have, you know, all of the teachers from all the different schools, and there I was. I was Malcolm X. I was standing up in front of all of them and said, this is a racist system here that's designed to keep black and brown students out of the higher level courses. And I went on and fought that with them. And finally, I'll tell y'all this, finally, that I did get a, a, a chance to become the chairperson of the math department at the school where uh, I, I met uh, Dr. Cole. I was the math chairman there. The mm-hmm. other teachers there who saw, okay, black students are now coming into the higher level math classes. They resigned, they left, they went to other schools, they couldn't deal with it. But dealing with that all the time, I have always uh, confronted the powers that be, and I've always told them, look, this is not equity that's going on here. Why not? So that was my fight on that end too, y'all. Mm-hmm. When I think about all the college professors around this country who have their students who are supposed to teach mostly black and brown kids uh, once they graduate, uh, they have them reading Diane Ravitch, you know, and they should be reading Malcolm X. That's like Malcolm X uh, should be part of, uh, and I agree with you, Mr. Brown, that should be part of teacher preparation, educator superintendent preparation, counselor preparation, principal certification. All of the above, but they, you know, these professors got got uh, aspiring teachers reading Diane Ravitch and crazy folks like that. So you know, it's a, uh, you know, we got a, a a mountain to climb and a whole lot of folks uh, to to reeducate uh, before they get in front of our kids. Yeah, I, you know, I disavow. I disavow. Me and which Diane part Ravitch. you disavow? You want Diane, Diane Ravitch? Me and Diane Ravitch are friends. So good. She is, she is, Enjoy. She is going, she is, she is on the NYU faculty where I where I reside, and I, I'm distancing myself from this Sharif uh, statement. So uh, yeah, Diane is crap. But go ahead, carry on. So, Mr. Brown, I, I appreciate that, and now hearing that now at 38, it kind of makes a little bit more sense why you were so excited when I was the highest scorer in that class. Um, I remember you like really, really pushing. Uh, me around and and you know in that classroom to like be as good as I could be. So thank you for that. But you made a lot of sacrifices to do this as well. Um, and I would love to just hear briefly. You know, you told me the story of how you were inducted or <laughs> into the into the Black Panthers. Basically, the conversation you had with the with the big guy. But then also, I would love to hear just what happened at St. Mary's. And 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 for the people that's listening, you know, Mr. Brown is a pretty tall brother. Uh, he came after Bill Russell. He went to the same school. Uh, Brown was probably the best ball player in the state, uh, relegated to go to the NBA. Like it was kind of laid out for you. Um, and, and you went to St. Mary's and played ball and your brother joins you. What 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 was the sacrifice that you made? Uh, or, like what happened? There was a story there. Yes, 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 yes. Now, my brother is a year older than me. My brother, Roy Brown. And he was at St. Mary's uh, first. And I was still at Mac. And when I say Mac, I'm talking about McClymouth High School. And for those listening, so, Mr. Brown, St. Mary's is a small college out in the Bay Area. It's a very small college in the Bay Area. Continue. I'm sorry. Right, right. But that's, that's right. Because perspective. St. Mary's is 
a predominantly white school of affluent white folks. I mean, super affluent. They have what is known as the LaSalian, LaSalle, LaSalian doctrine of educating people. But it's like, okay, it's St. Mary's, who do you want to educate? I mean, there's no black folks going up there. And uh, when I first uh, went up there in September 1969, St. Mary's was still, it was still uh, uh, all male camp. It was like one of the last uh, uh, schools to go co-ed when I was a sophomore. But I was a dangerous basketball player uh, in high school, and I had opportunities to attend any major university uh, in the country. The, the, the freshman coach, because back then they had freshman team, varsity team in college, the, 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 the uh, freshman coach from UCLA, he came up to high school, Mac, to, to talk to me personally and wanted me to come down to play basketball at UCLA, and that's when Lou Alcindor uh, which who later, you know, uh, uh, Kareem, you know, was playing. But my father, my strong, strong father, told me he said, you ought to go to school with Roy. You guys grew up together. You guys are brothers all through life. Go to school, Herman, and be with your brother. And I decided to go to St. Mary's to be with my brother. And we were still doing our thing, playing basketball. But in 1968 and 1969, that was the time when the Vietnam War was going on and it was raging. And everybody who was my age, we were scared to death about getting drafted because so many of our friends were going over there and some of them were not coming back. And at the same time, the Black Panther Party was the profound dominant issue across the country. It was no more we shall overcome. It's we're going to defend ourselves. And we're going to overcome what you're doing to us and make this be what is known as black power. All of these things were going on while I was a young man at the school. Now, St. Mary's, we had this black guy. His name was Odell Johnson. And he was the one responsible for recruiting black and getting black. He was the dean of men there that was starting to come to the school. And because he was doing that, the uh, so-called... Uh, you want to call them supervisors of the school that were running the school. They wasn't really liking that because, okay, all of a sudden, we got all these ethnic uh, uh, folks coming up to white Lily St. Mary. So they found a way uh, to uh, fire him, which was illegal how they did that. And everybody knew it. And they just cut him, uh, uh, you know, the uh, the notice and say, okay, well, you're, you're, uh, you're going to be terminated. And there was an uproar at the school, not just by the black students, but there was a lot of white kids up there who were hippies at that time and very liberal at that time. And they joined in with the black so-called movement. And when I say so-called, I'm talking about we were standing up against what was going on, but there was no action going on. It was just a lot of talk. So our black student union, we got together and said, well, what we're going to do is we're going to boycott a basketball game, St. Mary's versus St. Mary's rival, which was Santa Clara University. And this happened, y'all, 50 years ago in February. And I think it was February 22nd because St. Mary's, that school, honored the boycott for the five black players who walked out of the game which was myself, my brother, and three other guys. And they invited us to come back up to the school. And they acknowledged that what we did at the school was that we showed in our boycott bringing attention to the Bay Area where we live that racism was running rapid at the campus, at St. Mary's. And this mm. needs to be looked upon by outside that you can see, well, St. Mary's is nestled in on where it is located. And it's like something out of an old 1940 movie with Bing Crosby in it, that <laughs> this is what was going on up here at the campus. And we brought that out. And over the years, 
Y'all, St. Mary's, and I take my hat off to them, they still have a long way to go. They acknowledged that and said, if you guys had not made that sacrifice, you know, and went out there, then, you know, we would not have been able to see what we were doing. Nobody, it was like the emperor has on no clothes. You know, it was that was going on. But for me, I was the person with my basketball talent that I was highly sought after. I'm my junior year now. And uh, there was a, a, a scout who were looking at me uh, to be drafted uh, into the NBA. And I knew this because I had people who were these, these sharks, like these agents. They know, okay, if you're going to get drafted, I'm going to do a contract with you. Okay, and I was it was being made known to me. It was, it was something that was not a secret that I was in an inside track go into, okay, this guy can play this game good enough. He's going to be drafted into the NBA. It just so happened that our coach at that time, I got to take y'all back to some, some history, <laughs> but his name, I won't mention his name, but he was the, uh, the, 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 uh, now, spill the beans, uh, Mr. Brown, spill the beans. Wife, <laughs> his, his wife, okay, father-in-law, father-in-law. Of uh, 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 the great warrior player Rick Barry, okay, and he also was uh, at one time the coach of the ABA team, the uh, Oakland Oaks, and he was a very powerful, uh, successful college coach in in Miami, okay, and he had the inside track on everything, and he was pushing me too. He used to say, "Hey, Herm, you can play this game. You know, you you're going to be well." You know, he really knew that I, I was on the way to go and he was going to help me with it. But on the night of the boycott, when we decided to do this, the coach told me, he said, Her, don't do this. Don't do this. You're going to ruin your career. Don't do it. And I looked at him and I said, Coach, this is something that I have to do. And I made that decision, y'all, that it was more important to me that to stand up for what we were doing across the country, just like in Mexico City, when the brothers raised their fist and they lost their gold. You know, we mm -hmm. were doing that. It was going across across the nation. The, the whole atmosphere of us being black folks in this country was so solid, y'all. It was just so powerful, y'all, that this is what was going on spiritually and collectively, emotionally, and physically that we are all willing to lay it down, to take this burden off of our back to make improvements for the kids that were coming up. And I was a part of that. And I said, I will sacrifice any type of monetary career that's sitting out there in front of me. I'm not doing that. I'm going up here and stand for what's right for black folks across the country, across the world. And I'm not going to be out there, uh, like I said, on the podium, or, 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 or on a soapbox and speaking where I can get shot down. Say, I'm going to continue my education at this school and I'm going to get my degree and I'm going to get a teacher's credential and I'm going to take this message into the classroom. Mm. Hey, so, so Mr. Brown, really quick, because, you know, that was, that was a long one right there, but I want to I wanna jump into these stats, right? So fr your freshman year, you averaged over 15 points a game, 13 rebounds. 3.6 personal fouls. The next year, you had over four personal fouls. So what happened? Ankle injury, you couldn't move your feet. What was going on? What was going on was this. <laughs> is that when I was uh, uh, in, in, in college, that when, when I got my uh, offer to go to St. Mary, I was a forward in high school. As a matter of fact, I was the first six seven guard in uh, the Oakland Athletic League. And I was, uh, wasn't drafted, but just recruited to be a fault. The guy who they had to play center, who was supposed to be our center, he was 6'10". And he was coming out of Pittsburgh, California. And we had a solid team. We had a guy came from New Orleans. He was an All-American averaging 32 points a game. There was no three-point plays back then. But we had a solid team. But the year that I was a sophomore, uh, the guy who was supposed to be the center, he didn't come. And they had to 
turned me into a center. And I was playing center in the uh, NCAA, what they call the, the West Coast Athletic Association. I was a forward in high school. I had to convert to being a center. I was 6'7", and I was playing against guys who were 6'10", <laughs> 7 feet. That's what I was doing. I was out there defending them and still trying to play some moves. <laughs> I'm glad he was ready for an answer for you, Ray, because you just king derailer, man. Yeah, yeah. Sit him uh, down. Sit, sit him down, Mr. Brown. <laughs> sit him down. You know what I mean? Uh, but, uh, but, 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 but look, let me, let, let, ahead, let me just add on to this, y'all, because I appreciate the question. But the thing was, you're so polite. Like, I was doing that. I was still kicking. I was still kicking behind. <laughs> <laughs> These scouts were saying, man, this dude can play defense. If he can deep in these six seven, not six seven, six ten, six eleven, and still be out there mixing it up, I was off into it because I knew I was played out of pocket. Because if I had gone to any other college, you know, like I couldn't have been recruited to, I would have played a forward. But I went to St. Mary's and unfortunately that whole basketball uh uh program is just collapsed. And there I was out there trying to hold the whole team up there you go there mr you brown go. thank you for you know in um you know just answering random ray's question thank you we appreciate that you know what I mean? this is nickname random ray so but you, you know, know what you, we we, we can make a pair we can make a connection though we can say that story is a lot like black males being thrown into the wrong position in schools mm. uh and still having to play Mm -hmm. And might you might collect a few fouls, might have to step on a few toes, but you got to keep playing no matter what mm -hmm. they do to you. Now, you recruiting all these black male teachers, Sharif, and you know, every mm -hmm. time I talk about it, I say the same thing. Are you telling them the truth <laughs> of the situation that they're going to go into? Because giving them this wide, eyes wide open. I mean, bro, like giving them the, a Mary Poppins view of like, hey, save kids, come and, you know, be the the Sydney Portier of the classroom. And you're just going to stand up there and it's you're going to uh, be well dressed call, and look great. Call well, me, well. Uh, to serve with love type Joe. <laughs> bro, they're going to get in there. It's going to be like dangerous minds. And, you know, they're going to have uh, teachers crying in the lounge. They're going to have people pulling them aside saying, you know, I think you can relate to, to Jerome better than I can, blah, 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 whatever. And they're going to be like, I didn't sign up for all this. I didn't sign. I signed up to be a classroom teacher and of, I don't even know of my own students. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. That's your student. Your student. <laughs> Go back to your class. Stop crying or whatnot. But talk about being put in the wrong position. Uh, and I love Mr. Brown's story just all around. Uh, you know, having to be put in different positions, having to keep playing, uh, being in a system that you know is racist, being in a system that you know doesn't always have the children's best interest in mind, and having to, sh mm. to shake things up sometimes. Having to oh. scream justice, right? Having to scream about justice. Now, I don't know how he survived Charles Cole as a student uh, exactly, because <laughs> that's, that's a whole, whole different. Yeah, that's a whole other show, right? Ask, like, I, ask, you know, ask him. Ask him. He has the answer ready for you. Ask. Him. Okay, okay Mr. Amazing. Brown. Mr. Brown, we are asking you. How did you survive Charles <laughs> Cole as a student? Uh, knowing what we know about him as an adult, I don't know <laughs> what he would have been like as a child, but yeah. uh, we would just love to hear about it. <laughs> well, I can tell you all about it because he's my favorite and number one genuine student because he's a messenger. Uh oh, wait, where'd he go? Do we lose you? <laughs> see, we see, Cointel Pro knows when there's cap. <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> go and tell Pro when there's cat. Right, he said he's my favorite. Went, my, uh. <laughs> they didn't disappear. You, all right, buddy, disappeared. You, uh, <laughs> listen, brother, you disappearing back disappearing me now. They disappearing me now. Look at that. Look at my camera oh, going man. out. Look at this. Look at this. <laughs> Crazy racist technology in this world. Big tech coming at us. So, uh, audience members who are listening and watching, uh, we we have been, we are, we are very concerned that our brothers have been disappeared on uh, on our show. And whatnot. Uh, 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 um, That's wild. That's wild. Uh, but you know, uh, he, was, he, he he brought up uh, Malcolm a few times, and and you know, just talking about the school experience. And you know, 
one of the things that Malcolm would uh, critique is like societies that will, you know, really try to, you know, crush people, you know, grind their aspirations to dust, mm -hmm. grind them up to dust, um, and then penalize them for not being able to stand up under that weight. And you can replace society with schools, right, with classrooms, you know, grinding kids up to dust, grinding educators, you know, um, you know, just trying to crush them and then penalize them, criticizing them for not being able to, you know, um, you know, uh, handle that type of, you know, uh, weight. And so I, you know, I, I appreciate yeah, that, y'all. It was a surge. And I, no, it's, it's all good. It was back. funny. He's, it was funny. Back. Yeah, he, he, he's back. You, you, go ahead, uh, Mr. Brown. Okay, okay. And, and the question was about uh, surviving me because they're making me sound like I'm a terrible student. Be careful, you might get clicked off again. That's what the surge was from. As soon as you said that, that's where the surge came here, from. It was a cap surge. It was a cap surge. So, you know, say, how did I survive, Charles? Charles, oh, y'all might want to say, Charles, oh, how did you survive, Mr. Brown? See, that's like where <laughs> the, the question could take itself back to because when Charles came into my room, I had already been teaching for quite a while, you know, and uh, our school district wasn't one that was like, you know, an old show like Leave it to Beaver. We had some rough characters going on at the school. But as I said all of the time, as I stood in front of my students, I always gave them the consistency and the message. And when Charles came into my classroom, and I mentioned earlier about the Asian students that were so-called dominating the math uh, instructional criteria at the school. And I used to bust them out. Charles, you might not remember this. You might. But I used to bust them out. And all of the black students, the majority of them were saying, dang, you know, the Chinese, and that's what they would say, you know, the Chinese are smarter than math. They're smarter than us. And I would say, no, they're not. I said, because they go to an auxiliary school. And by an auxiliary school, I mean that they go into their community in Chinatown. And they take math classes at the auxiliary school. When they come to the regular school, they already know what the curriculum is. So they look superior to everybody else, but they've already taken the course. And when I used to bust them out on that, they used to hate me for that because I exposed them to their so-called superiority. Charles Cole was a person that listened to me when I was saying that and said, you can outdo anybody. And that's exactly what he did. He outscored all students. And I will be specific about saying the Asian students because I was so proud of him because he was the black student that I had that said, okay, this is where all math originated from, was from Africa. And this is where the sciences are from, from Africa. And I say, I finally got me a student up here that can kick everybody behind up in here. So I'm so <laughs> proud of him, y'all, on that. That's wow. how I survived, sir. <laughs> you know, That's what's up. That's what's well, I know up. we coming up to an end, but I will I will say this much about that answer, which I think is amazing, because I just read something earlier today about a woman who's writing a book about what what Asian parents and white parents do in very rich districts, and it's, the book is going to be called Race at the Top. Um, and she she details what the what the uh, what the Asian parents do different than what everybody else does, uh, and including the white folks. And um, what you just said, I think with Charles uh, being in a classroom that was heavily Asian or whatnot, I think there's a lot of game to that, to talk to, to have a whole another discussion about that and think through uh, that message that you gave him, Mr. Brown, we need to give to a lot more students because um, they're striking down special programs for black students. They're striking down special programs at the college level and they're doing it under the guise of it being unfair to Asian students uh that that you know we be given any breaks like we get any breaks or any you know any special treatment or whatnot so this is going to become a very interesting discussion i didn't know this about you charles that you were you know in that class uh fighting it out in that way but there, there's something there that we should talk about in the future going forward now i know he lied mostly about how good you were about <laughs> him, right? so i do know that part so we should just be real to folks that there's some sort of you know like he likes you he likes you as a person so, you know, so, so, you know, a little bit of that, but not to take all the way from you. I'm sure you, you were 
uh, you know, moderate. Nah, man, they're, they're, I'll, 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 I'll go a little deeper into the into the story in my closing because it's you know it is a pretty like actually an emotional story. It was a lot going on in my life then. I was like homeless, homeless at that time, and like I had that accent, and it was it was rough. I was getting into fights. It was a bunch of stuff happening, and Brown was just like, nah, you're not now. Well, he he used some very colorful language. He's six seven. He has a very very big voice, and Brown had a rule in class around. Uh, some of y'all think y'all gonna be big and bad and, and start a fight, and you think that I'm gonna jump in the middle and stop it. I'm not. I'm gonna let all of y'all fight, and then I'm suspending everybody. And Brown never had fights in his class, but Brown made me come to class before school and after school. Um, and then I did end up having, I had the highest score, not just in that class, but in, I had the highest math score uh, from, I was the last class of eighth and ninth graders. I had the highest in the school as an eighth grader uh, from everybody. So, um, but nah, man, I know we're coming up on time. I, I, I do want to kind of roll in the final thoughts and, and give Brown the last one. And just and that's just in case people have questions that they want him to roll up in there, because I'm definitely going to ask Brown on, on Cherie's behalf um, just what advice he would have for, uh, you know, to, to, for, for black males around why they should really consider teaching. But, you know, so Sharif, that should free you up to do whatever you want to do. But Sharif, let's go ahead and just start with you and your final thought for, for Mr. Brown. Yeah, no, I'm I'm excited to uh, to meet you and and you know thanks for you know thanks for joining us um, you know and sharing your perspective and particularly around you know the activism that you brought in you you said something earlier where you said nothing could have prepared you um, you know to teach and what I got from that is a lot of the you know traditional ways of training teachers um, is not consistent with how you know the relationship of teaching and learning in Black communities. And because what you did bring with you that I think did prepare you well was your activism um, and this agitated this uh, orientation to agitate for change um, and not passively uh, wait for change just to occur. Uh, but the agitation that you brought, the, the advocacy, the uh, freedom fighting orientation is, you know, to me, part and parcel of what being an effective educator is. So I'm, I'm grateful that I was grateful to hear that. Um, you know, that perspective and experience that that your uh, activism came alive in classrooms. Um, so thank you. Thanks for, for being here. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. Thanks for, for your work um, in and with and for uh, our communities. Mm -hmm. We'll just we'll just stay in sync, uh, Chris. So um, I will say thank you for on. Um, multiple accounts. Thank you for, uh, for joining us tonight. Thank you for recounting a lot of what was really important about your story and your teaching strategy. Um, thank you also for playing that role in Charles' life to the point where all these years later, he would want to tell this story. He would want to bring it up. I started out early in the night talking about the fact that I don't have that situation. So it's always nice to see it when someone else does, when they have that teacher that they remember who pushed them, who was there for them and had a special connection uh, uh, that where they didn't feel like the other or they didn't feel like a foreigner in the classroom. To me, that's amazing. I love to hear the, that story. Um, I also love to hear about um, everything that you said about having to do what you got to do. Um, when the system isn't with you, when you know what the kids need, um, when you have special insight, but you, you start from a realistic perspective of the system wasn't designed for us. It, the system is racist. It's not made for us, but you still got to teach. You still got to do what you got to do. So uh, I just thank you for all of that and, and um, would love to see that story repeated a million times over in other places. So thank you, Mr. Brown. Awesome. Ray? So I'm actually going to yield my time to Mr. Double Double Herman Brown, right? Because I want to hear more what he has to say, but I wanted to name the fact that that man averaged a double double in college. I appreciate you, sir. Okay. Uh, if this is close to y'all young brothers, the one thing that I would say an old word that I hope y'all understand and say what vexes me is this, is that with young kids that I've witnessed over the years, all the years, y'all, because I started off in 1976 when the Vietnam War was ending and there was a lot of peace and harmony. 
across the country. And there was it was disco music, and they still had live bands playing at a school dance. But over the years, I saw the decline in that type of spirit because the messages were not there anymore. They were gone. We got bombarded with black exploitation movies and uh, in the late 60s and early 70s. And a whole lot of rap music, gangster rap particularly, you know, it sent a message to so many kids of sending them some insane reality of them not pursuing their spiritual essence and going on to be the great kings and queens that they are, but to be participators in a drug-related uh, a society of, uh, of being prominent and economically successful in that degree and degrading women. That message was out there, y'all, and it was strong, and I watched it. I just hope that as time goes by, that younger generations and, and, and so-called people who have power with media, uh, I can't even think of their names uh, uh, off the top of my head, but Oprah Winfrey and what's the guy, y'all? Help me out. What's the guy who does the much here thing? What's his name? Oh, Tyler Perry. Tyler mm -hmm. Perry. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And, and, and Spike Lee, you know, if, golly, I always just say, how come y'all can't get together and put some kind of TV series or some movies about kids growing up and uh, being goody two-shoe kids <laughs> with uh, 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 an incentive to uh, be knowledgeable and do some historical things that they don't know anything about ancient Egypt, about Kemet. They don't know that's a black nation that was the founder of all knowledge on this planet. They don't know that. And if some kind of uh, series of things could be done with that, it would make a difference if that kind of uh, collective mindset could, could reoccur. Because I was fortunate, y'all, that the civil rights movement in the early 60s, you know, I was in elementary school and started junior high school. But at the, the end of junior high school and going into high school, then it, it went to the Black Power Movement. But we had that in front of us all the time with those messages. That's why everybody was wearing Afros then and uh, uh, standing up for our Black uh, consciousness. That was the thorough message in the song that the artists were playing. They, they were, 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 were putting it down. Like when James Brown in 1968 said, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. That turned it all out. But they kept being messages. Where are those messages now that kids can hear? And I'm sure if the younger people uh, could get that out there and make sure in the media that you send those messages to children, because children are like sponges. They are going to emulate what they see, and they are going to project that. They're going to internalize that, and they're going to be a part of that. I just hope that can come back one more time, y'all. That's my only hope. Man, and I just want to thank you so much for being here, Mr. Brown. It means a lot, man. Um, uh, I, I love you to death, man. And, uh, and again, I, I know I get this rap about being hard on ed educators and teachers, and like I said, I'm not. I've just had quality before. I've had filet mignon and you can't give me a white castle burger and tell me it's the same thing and our kids deserve better because i've seen better um i've been blessed to be able to sit at the feet of a herman brown of howard fuller's the elaine browns um the, the panthers in my neighborhood in my community that have always held me accountable and pushed me to be great um we didn't get around to your advice to to, to new folks kind of coming in but We'll do something else with you. We'll figure it out. Uh, I wish we could have got a chance to see you, but having you on this phone was still uh, such an honor, such a blessing. And to our audience, sorry that there were technical issues, but we worked it out um, and you got to at least hear this voice. Uh, I would love for you and, 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 and Sharif to connect as he's uh, bringing in a new crop oh, yeah, of black stuff. educators. They need to hear from them. So, yeah, we're going to hook something up. The biggest honor of my life, uh, Mr. Brown, uh, Outside of uh, being raised by, you know, Ozetta Hooper and 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 uh, the biggest the biggest of my life is being able to sit 
at your feet and just learn uh, and, and, and to push me into greatness. Uh, I became a scholar in that class. I was never not a scholar after that. I never got anything lower than a three, six or three, seven after that. Uh, I never, you know, Brown fought for me to be in that class when they tried to put me back uh, in the regular math one, math two. And Brown said he can do it. And not only can he do it well, he can do it better than everybody else here. You will not put that boy back. Uh, my parents, when they were getting clean, came in. And I think I remember him. I was sick and my mother came and he uh, stopped the class to honor my mother who was who was like in recovery, who was getting clean and like told her, you know, what I'm saying all the things I was doing in that place. Um, and I think that actually helped my father as he was getting clean. So, again, uh, Brown, we honor you. Uh, I thank you so much. And fellas, I thank you all for letting me have this episode. You have been listening to another episode of the A Black Hands for Mr. Brown, uh, Chris, Ray and Sharif. I'm Charles and we will see you all 